favorite? It's my oh. first live with Kobe. <laughs> this is, yeah, it's my first live with Brit too. <laughs> I'll be on my best behavior. It's supposed to be a chat. It's supposed to be pretty chill. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. So, hello, hello, hello. Today, we're going to be talking about nonfiction, especially Black authors writing nonfiction. Um, because, I mean, I can mention that. In my, I guess I should start if I'm going to mention it. Because I'm just trying to read more of it. And I've been thinking about, like, how do I find what I'm interested in? How do I find Black authors writing what I'm interested in? And right. so you all, I know that you all read more nonfiction than I do. And so I wanted to talk about with you, like what gets you into it? What gets you excited to get through it? And also like, how do you find stuff and then get some, some wrecks? Um, so yeah, hey, everybody in the comments, hey, Goldby and Shamla and Emma Ray and Bethany. Um, so I think what were my intro questions? My intro questions just names, pronouns. Uh, how frequently do you read nonfiction? And what, what type do you like to read? So Chloe, oh, you should be her. If you're here, you probably know me. Um, <laughs> I don't that. I read like one nonfiction book a year. <laughs> this year I'm trying to read four. So, so we can change that up a little. Wow. Um, I read like four a month. Yeah. It. And in terms of like what I like to read right now, it's mostly like literary criticism and like a little bit of history. Okay. And I'm trying to get more. I like I found some science writing that I like. It's something I really enjoy because I like like naked documentaries and stuff. But I'm really trying hard to find like black authors writing. Yeah. Like science writing, and that's been a an uphill struggle. Um. Me or you, Britt? <laughs> well, you were already speaking, so I'm tempted to say go ahead. But no, I'm already speaking, so here I go. Um, I am Britt. My channel is Britt Writerly. It's a book and author tube where I talk about the intersections of literature and culture, um, share some original writing content, and a monthly writing vlog with like, book reviews very rarely, but you know, they're there. Um, I read nonfiction fairly regularly because I'm in graduate school in an Africana studies doctoral program. So, you know, it's part of the diet. Um, that's really the majority of what I was reading before I started my book tube in July. Um, I'm coming up on a year. Hmm. Um, but so yeah, that was the majority of my diet. Now the majority of my diet is like, fiction because I'm like running away from my responsibilities but please don't tell my committee they already know it's okay um so yeah I mean I don't know how many I read a month um because I my dissertation is about literature anyway so I read a lot of literature and the most of my nonfiction is more like literary criticism um and different theories I'm reading like monster theory right now so that's interesting um is that all of the introductory questions? Like I don't have them open in a tab. I'll just talk if you don't stop me, please. Stop I think me. that was everything. Okay, great. All right, young Bree, not young, I'm 30. Um, so uh, I have a channel called Lock Petition and my name is Bree and I use she and her pronouns. So um, I read a lot of nonfiction which I'm mad that I don't really share on my channel. <laughs> it's usually fiction, but um, I do read a lot of nonfiction. I probably, I try to read at least two to four a month. Um, rather it's a book or an article. Um, I always have to feel like I'm reading nonfiction because I'm also a therapist who specializes in trauma, specifically with black and indigenous folks. So I feel like I need to constantly always be consuming some type of nonfiction that um, speaks light to those communities. Um, I prefer to read um, nonfiction that focus on analyzing trauma in the body, um, trauma within uh, marginalized communities, um, 
astrophysics. <laughs> I really love astrophysics. Um, and then different conversations about race or um, relationships that comes from like an intersectional point of view. Um, and I like to read nonfiction that talks about like um, vaginas and sex health and really living your best. Um, and I also like reading nonfictions that talks about disabilities that um, I'm not familiar with or genders that I'm not familiar with because I feel like our world has so many different people with so many identities. And as a therapist, it is my job and also my personal goal to know as much as I can know and be as informed as I can be about the people who are living in this world. So those are, that's my spill in my TED talk. <laughs> Everyone in the comments wants more nonfiction from you. Shamla says it, Emma Ray, Colby, Bethany. I just filmed a video today and it was a nonfiction book. It was a review. So definitely. I do like I did it before and I didn't know that like that was okay on booktube because I full disclosure, I didn't really know that booktube existed until I decided to make a booktube channel. I didn't know that was already like a niche. I was like, <laughs> if I do it like anyone, does anyone just go into my, my talk about books? And then as I was looking, I then I found all these people and I was like, oh, it's a thing. Okay, cool. What are the rules? What to talk about? And I didn't really see a lot of people talking about nonfiction. So for the first like half of my channel, I didn't really talk about it. And then in January, I started doing my Within the Discourse series where I talk about, and that's how I, I sort of engage um, nonfiction topically. So like talking about like politics and respectability. So I talk about Evelyn Burke kick and bottoms. I'm like talking about poetry for April. So I may talk about like Dion Brand or Christina Sharp within the wake or something like that. But yeah, I had to figure out a way to like choose what nonfiction to talk about on my channel. Otherwise it'd be really overwhelming for me and everybody witnessing. So yeah. Yeah, I, I think the uh, nonfiction book community is smaller. I know Ghost Reader does a lot of nonfiction. Yeah. Um, and I know there's nonfiction November, but it's, I think the first time it happened, I was like, okay, the first time it happened, I wasn't really doing much of anything on book two. I was just posting TBRs once a month and kept it pushing. And, then, <laughs> <laughs> and the, just the honesty for me. Yeah, absolutely. And like the second no, uh, nonfiction November, uh, I had just finished hosting the Black Eyes of Ethicon. I was like, I'm so tired. I don't want to do anything not a single thing <laughs> so me reading nonfiction wasn't gonna happen because it is like a i'm working on how i read it i feel like it either takes a lot of oh, nonfiction november hosted by book do we know yeah done i yeah i feel like when i'm reading nonfiction, i'm either like aggressive skimming <laughs> aggressively skimming probably like <laughs> i'm reading like a classic where i'm like translating it in my head and then i'm like but that's also not i feel like that's also like missing things right because like if i'm just like reading like that then i can't really be like do i agree with this do i disagree with this what are like the limits of what's being said and so i'm also trying to change my reading habits when it comes to fiction, I see Britt making judgmental faces. Yeah. <laughs> no, no. What is it? I know it's bad. I know it's bad. No, it's actually the exact opposite. Because then I was wondering, like, how how Brie reads nonfiction. Because, like, graduate students, academics in general, if they're being honest, but if they're not, I'm going to tell it, um, read nonfiction differently. Yeah. So, like, when I, like, mm -hmm. so monster theory which like this is um, a collection of essays, so it's definitely different, but like um, The Dark Fantastic, great example. I'm in my library, so I have all of these nonfiction books at my little fingertips. Um, so The Dark Fantastic, which I buddy read with Deidre. Mm -hmm. Yep, um, and Shade Tree Reads. I, I, li I listened to this book fully, but had I been reading it, I, the way I read nonfiction is I, I read the introduction closely 
And most books in the introduction will have a, a sort of chapter breakdown about like the arguments of each chapter, the text they're going to engage in the major interlocutors of each chapter. Based off of that, I then choose what chapters I am most interested in and I will read those closely. And then that is how I engage with the text. Because like in graduate school, when you're reading one of these a week and you have three classes. Come on. You're reading three a week, um, and they're not all this tiny. Like, yeah, they are. Some of these jokers are tomes, so yes. I, I don't, I don't. There's a way to. I had to relearn how to read when I got to graduate school. I thought I was like very literate, and then I got here, and I was like, can I actually read? That's the question we should start with. But it's just a different way to read, and also. Um, if I'm like really, really unfamiliar with it, like if we're reading like a black political theorist or black black Marxism, huge yeah. tone, right. um, also seminal. So like you need to know yeah. it. But if you don't have a background in political theory, then it may help to start by reading um, several book reviews. So you already have the argument laid out. You have multiple people interpreting it from multiple fields and saying, here's what's um, valuable in the text. Here's what the text did for the field. Like you already have that set up. And then when you enter the text, you already sort of have some comfortability with the material and then you can go in. Yeah. So that's, that's why I was like, you know, that, that, that was the phase. I was like, I don't read it like that either, Chloe. I'm, yeah. <laughs> I'm not reading it from front to back like that. I I definitely agree. So just to start, so sometimes, not even sometimes, oftentimes I find my nonfiction recommendations from references in um, like APA, which is American Psychology Association journals. Like I'll go, I'll find an article that I like, go to the references and like, oh, I really love that quote that was mentioned or whatever, and then find the book and then read the chapter that pertains <laughs> to the um, the article that I'm reading. So that's one way of reading. So it depends on the nonfiction. So if the nonfiction is poetry, I'm reading it till it's fullest from front to back. If it's a memoir from front to back, if it's just about someone talking about a specific issue in depth, I'm going to do it front to back. Now, for example, let me give you an example. Uh, oh yeah, this is a perfect example. This book right here, Small Doses by Amanda Seals. Loved this book. I did not read it linearly. I read like one chapter in the back, one in the middle, one in front. So when it's set up like this book, I just, I'm hopping around. I read it all, but I'm hopping around. And it's probably going to take like a couple months to finish it because I'm literally hopping around. Um, Roxane Gay, um, her nonfiction, I usually read it straight through. I haven't read Bad Feminist yet, but Hunger, I just read straight through. And this was a book that I also hopped around. So um, I read like a couple different chapters and then I went in and read it that way. So if there is like, like Britt was saying, if it's like broken up in sections, which is also this book that I've been reading for like a year, Pleasure Activism, um, just hopping around, you know, is usually what I um, do, but I also have this book over here. I'm trying not to pull them all out, but I have this book over here called um, Radical Self-Love, I think, by Sonia Renee Taylor. Um, oh, I read that, that has a really free uh, cover, doesn't it? Yeah. I read that one because it comes with prompts. Like, I love a book that gives your girl prompts. I'm going to read that fully through, you know? So also 21 Days of White Supremacy by um, Layla... Saad, I read that straight through because each week really causes you to be reflective in the way that you have benefited and also push white supremacist ideas. So for me, it really depends on the layout of the book, but Brit, straight up, because I went to grad school and listen, I plan to get my PhD. Brit, I'm expecting fully that you help me on that journey, but <laughs> I plan to get my PhD, but your girl is going to be hopping around hop, hop. They're going to call me breathe a bunny hopper because ain't nobody got time to be reading a full book when you really need, you know, the end. Exactly. And like, you, you're going to be mad. Like I was like my first couple of weeks here in grad school, I said, my sleep was jacked up. Yes. I was trying to read the, 
ethnographies? Hell no. Absolutely Hell no. Not. Ethnographies like, are so boring. <laughs> read the introduction, read the conclusion, read the book reviews, go your way. Like, but I was so mad because I'm like staying up till three in the morning on chapter one. That's the other thing. It's like when you're reading a novel, you're like per page time might be like two minutes. When you're reading nonfiction, your per pay, your per page time is five minutes. It's um, and that's right. Like that, and that's if you're familiar with the text, because it does, like yeah. you were saying, Chloe, it makes you go slower. Like you have to think about ideas. They're calling in multiple thinkers. You just have to slow down. I didn't know that. So I was staying up real late trying to read the entire thing like a noob. And then we get to class and all these jokers over here citing Marx. We're reading an ethnography. That's how you know they didn't do the reading. But exactly. So only like I do the introduction sort of like way because it lets me see the entire argument. And then no matter what we talk about, I can pivot with you. But if I just hyper focus on one chapter, because I'm not going to be able to read it all. And they talk about chapter five where I didn't get to then it's it's just difficult to know what's going to come up in class. Mm. Uh, in the comments, Colby says they're really liking your discourse series. I have only watched one so far, oh. but I really like it. I'm hoping to watch more so I don't have to read Thank these. You. <laughs> <laughs> Brit is a genius. I don't Absolutely know why not. that you don't say that about yourself more often. I'd be like, I wish I could speak so eloquently like that. I just be saying shit, you know, you just, the way you piece together a sentence, amen. <laughs> Brie, I love you. I love you. You have wonderful energy, but I don't say it because it's not true. That's for starters. I try not to lie. I want to live an honest life. <laughs> There's some recommendations in the comments about using like audio for nonfiction. Um, that's what it is. For them. And then who else? Then who was it? Someone said yeah. that they can only do that with like memoirs or kind of like pop size mm -hmm. stuff. They need yeah. that kind of thing. So, what, yes. what is so you not know, yeah. not fiction for you? I actually differ. So, audiobook when non fictions is so hard for me because I need to highlight, write a sentence. Absolutely. The way my brain works is that everything I've read, whether I remember it fully or not, I connect it to everything I read. So mm -hmm. if I have the book, I'm able to do like a little note, like, oh, that reminds me of that. Like, So when I was reading um, uh, How to Be Anti-Racist by Ibram X. Kendi and also reading Hood Feminist by Makiki um, Kendall. There were so many similarities that I needed the physical book so I can be like, oh yeah, this was in chapter three or all that. That it's it just makes sense. And then while I was reading um, different parts of How to Be Anti Racist, I was like, oh, this reminds me of you know 21 Days of White Supremacy or reminds me of How to Be Free, um, How We Be Free or something like that, the name of the book. So for me, I need to have the physical- Oh, How We Get Free? How We Get Free. Bye. What is her name? I have the book over here and I'm just not- She was talking about, about the, uh, the Come By River Collective. Yes, there we go. Right. There we go. I'm seeing so, the entire book and not her name. Yep, yep. So, and I haven't even finished that book. So it, depending on the, the nonfiction too, it might take me years to finish it. Um, I don't know if you feel that way, Britt, but cause I'll just read pieces of it and then there will be a time where I finish it, but I don't I know. I was to trying to remember her name, Kiara or Yamada Taylor. You were Never wondering how I feel about what? Um, sometimes it takes me to years to finish a nonfiction because I'm just reading pieces of it. Here's the thing. <laughs> Brooke doesn't have years. I mean, I have five to six years to finish this oh, program. Wow. We're trying to get on down. So <laughs> I, we have two different definitions of finish. When I, when this, this class discussion on that book is done, unless I am drafting that into my thinking for my dissertation, we are finished. So, yes. because like the way I have read, I understand your argument. Like, for instance, when, when you enter your PhD program, future Dr. Bree, um, <laughs> and you have comprehensive exams, and it's different for every program and every yeah, university. And whatever. I hear a lot about comps and they scare me because a lot of my friends have two comps. They have like a part A and a part B. Oh, well, yeah, I mean, it depends. Like for, for my program, you have 
comps is a, it takes you a year to finish comp. Well, like it's it is a two part process. So like the first semester, I guess, which like I started mine in the summer because I know it was going to be more time. I don't like to be rushed. Um, so you have a, a committee and you have a field advisor for everyone. So you have three fields. Um, like mine were black and black women's intellectual history, um, black literary theory, and then black performance and performativity. So I had to have a field advisor for each of those fields um, that like were conversant in that field. And you have to have um, a reading list of 60 to 100 texts. Right. And so right. when you're reading between 180 and 300 texts in like six to eight months, once again, you're reading in a different way and you're reading for argument. So because like you said, you need to be able to like put those things in conversation. So it's not just what did Roxane Gay say is how is she agreeing with or intervening and in what Bell Hooks said and what time exactly. was this written all of these exactly. things, right? So exactly. I don't have to finish like the cover to cover to feel finished. If I know what their intervention and contribution was to the field, I'm, yeah. I'm moving forward. Yeah. I just have a way more holistic view of reading nonfiction than I do yeah. with like my reading beloved. I'm reading that book three times. I'm like, okay, what does it mean if one, two, four started off spiteful and then it was loud and then it was quiet? And is it 124 or <laughs> one, two, four? Like that's like it's just so much closer reading. It's different than like for me yeah. than nonfiction. I mean, I'm actually doing a review on Beloved. I'm trying to get it together, but looking at it from like a black historical trauma like aspect of like how it shows up and appears throughout the text. Exactly. Come on with the books. Okay. Amen. Yes. Amen. How to read African American literature, post civil rights fiction, and the task of interpretation. And she's yes. using psychoanalysis. Ada Levy Hudson. Yeah. That's um, on the TBR. I really want to read it because she used like psychological theories, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Tra she uses trauma theory. Yes. Um, I can also email you the, she does, because the thing about nonfiction books is like they, sometimes these like scholars will write essays about the topic of the book before the book. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so she has an essay that I was literally just reading a little bit yesterday because I'm citing her in my dissertation. Um, I love it. And I can email you the uh, the like essay because there's a, a book called oh, The Second yeah. Hold of Slavery. And she has an, a chapter in there and she's talking about um, like the like the psychic turn in black literature or something like that. But it's very it's like very analogous to what she's talking about in the book. Okay. So I can send you that um, and you may be able to get to it faster than you can to get to the book. So. Oh, yeah. Send me that. Oh, going just a brief pause. Going back to Shamla, um, ethnographies is pretty much a story of a anthropologist typically discussing a culture um, from like an individualistic um, point of view, typically. Not all the time, though. It's just um. like giving you insight into this culture. A uh, question for you, Britt. What's your dissertation topic? My um, my dissertation. <laughs> sorry, I was on a different type trying to find this um, the name of this thing for Brie. Um, okay. My dissertation topic. What a fraught question. Um, but <laughs> briefly, and to the best <laughs> of my current knowledge, today, right now, um, my dissertation is on. Um, monstrous fugitivity so i'm looking at the like interpretations of fugitivity through monsters so i'm looking at dread nation looking at zombies i'm looking at mediums i'm looking at ghosts and about how those um how each of those monsters are iterations of the fugitive because the fugitive shape shifts um and so that's why i'm using monster theory to talk about like the different um ways that monsters are stand-ins for um, people of color. Um, and so then how to, how we interpret slavery, how we address slavery from those positions. So I'm reading Kindred by Octavia Butler, and that's my grounding text. And I'm reading her with Toni Morrison's Beloved, Justina Ireland's Duology, Dread Nation, and Deathless Divide, maybe Rivers, Solomon the Deep, um, and lots of books, actually it's a dissertation. So I'm reading a lot of books, but those are, uh, they're books that like reinterpret, or re, um, re 
confront slavery. Um, so yeah, and I'm looking at the way that like the neo-slave narrative of like eruption that happened in like the 70s, 80s, yeah. I feel like it's coming back in the last five years in YA mm. fantasy. So like yeah. graduation. Um, Daughters of like, Jubilation. So, which I'm re I had to buy that. Um, Legend yeah. Born, like all these yeah. books whose dramatic action depends upon the protagonist going back to meet an ancestor of slavery or having to confront the legacy of slavery in their own life personally. I'm looking at what's going on with, with that. Okay. Um, so yeah. Have you, so there's a middle grade that I just read that um, like speaks to it in a way. So um, and there's also a book Pet by Quakey Amizi, which has some of those themes. Mm -hmm. Um, and also Ghost Squad by I forget who oh, wrote it. It's middle grade. Was Ghost Squad by Carabao or Tigger? I think so, yeah. Um, so those might be some books you wanna look into, Brett, as well. And they're very short reads. Can you private chat me them? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Also for talk, I don't know, this might not be useful, but if you haven't read Body Minds Reimagined, it's about um, mm. disability, race, and gender, and Black women's speculative fiction. And there was a chapter on um, neo-slave narratives that I found very interesting. Um, so, What's the book? Body Minds Reimagined by Sam Michelle. Yeah, that's on my um, Amazon wish list. <laughs> I think, I don't know. You know. Good uh, that was interesting. Kiki brought up reading like nonfiction, like with fiction, like for authors who write both. Absolutely. Um, Toni Morrison is such a good example of that. Like playing in the dark seminal text, but also oh. just like reading yeah. her. I'm reading, I'm really reading Song of Solomon with Erica right now. And oh, I'm reading I, that too right now. Oh my gosh, you should join everybody to read it. I love her forward of Song of Solomon. The way she reads the first sentence where she talks about starting with North Carolina and ending with the with the um with the lake or Lake Superior and then talking about how it's an inversion of the black migration, which usually goes from south to north, but this mm -hmm. one is going from north to south because that's where Muckman has to return yeah. um, to, to fully mature. Like what like I, I I meant what I said when I said that like the best sentence in all of litter like the most busy first sentence that like does so much for the text I think is Alice Walker's The Color Purple Even I Never Told Nobody But God Fight Me mm -hmm. If You Want To Debate Your Aunt But I still love 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 the work that that first sentence in Song of Solomon is doing. And I really love that Toni Morrison does these forwards where she says, cause she does it for like Beloved and the like she goes back for all of her books and says, here's what I was attempting to do. Yeah, um, and the, and the source of self-regard. I haven't, I haven't even read that one yet. Oh yeah, she talks individually about her books. It's really good. I need to get to it. Oh, Brett, I also meant to say, I don't know when you're working on your dissertation by, but um, River Solomon has a book coming out. I think it's in May, um, which I have an arc of, which is Starland, and that might fit more into the monstrosity thing than the deep. Um, it's about this woman who was living in this, like, um, like very religious, um, like, pan -af like, African nationalist, Black nationalist um, community, and about, like, these weird transformations her body's undergoing and like these hauntings she's having from the past that involves her seeing visions from like people she's known and also from like the history of like the area. Like um, there is a point where there's like a, a slave owner who, who like visits her and like how she's impacted by what she's seeing and also like the types of transformations her body's undergoing. It does feel very monstrous for her. Mm -hmm. Thank you. That sounds amazing. I'm just, can you say that again? Uh, yeah, Sorrowland. Oh, Sorrowland. Yes. Okay. Yes. What is the one that you told me like five minutes ago that I was like preparing to write down and then got completely distracted? Um, Body Minds Reimagined by Sam. Thank you. I like Amen. this. Helping sis out with that dissertation. Amen. Do you hear me? Amen. Bless your ministry. <laughs> Because <laughs> I just changed my dissertation, honestly. Like, it was looking more at, like, 
Black women's literary fiction of like literary postmodern eruption. And I changed it like literally six weeks ago because I was like, I just don't have any energy around this. And the prospectus process exhausted me for this project. I feel like I sacrificed a lot to get that project passed and it wasn't what I wanted anymore. By the time they were okay with it. Um, so I pivoted to a new canon with new questions and this just feels like I have more energy for it. But that means I'm like now having to read an entire canon on like science fiction and fantasy and black women's engagement with that like traditionally right. white traditionally masculine genre and also like dealing with genre normativity all these different things yeah. um so all of the recommendations your girl wants and needs that is all psa over <laughs> so we've kind of talked about why everyone's drawn to nonfiction um a bit but like i don't know i'm curious for people who are reading nonfiction, like in their spare time more so as opposed to academically how is that different for you if at all yeah so i think and uh brit definitely um <laughs> come in if you're like what i do come from it mainly academically, um, I think because of my master's program and my actual job outside of Booktube. So it's it's usually me coming from an educational um, standpoint, but this, let me pull it up. I just pulled it in my hand. Okay, sorry, I was like, oh, I can't find it. I will die on the hill of reading astrophysicists um, work, specifically Neil deGrasse Tyson. I'm looking for other black physicists who write books, but for me, reading about science of any kind um, by black authors is like everything for me. So that would be like my leisure spare time thing. Um, because apart from this, I tend to read a lot of nonfiction by black women who are talking about their identity as black women and how our bodies have been weaponized um, and different things like that. Like there's a book called um, Fear in the Black Body that I uh, really want to read. And I think a black woman wrote that as well. So for me, reading books like that is can be leisure, but also help me in my practice. So really, it really depends because I'm also finding myself trying to read more nonfiction about cultures that are different than myself because I'm also trying to set up parts of my life where I can open up my own um, private practice so that I can provide therapy for BIPOC. So the leisure part, like just randomly reading, would be astrophysicist or something about vaginas, really. <laughs> <laughs> I yeah, here's the thing. No leisure in grad school. That's the first thing. That's actually the first thing. That there is no such thing as leisure in graduate school. Mm -hmm. Like you, it's hard one if you have it. Like and I think yeah, no, I don't think I, I don't remember ever having leisure. I think my first the day before graduate school, I was like this might be the last day of freedom I have for a while. And I was really on to something. So, and especially now that I'm like, also like working on like my own creative um, manuscripts and like trying to align that with uh, with my matriculation. Like I have writing goals that I'm like, you know, I want to pitch this book this time and hopefully have an agent for it by this time. Like that, any leisure time that I could carve out is completely obliterated in the leisure of not working on my dissertation. Like that's what leisure is, not working on the dissertation. Um, so I don't, I tend to not touch nonfiction when I don't have to. Um, <laughs> that's just what it is. Like, I, I just have a weird relationship to it now. Like, it just feels like work. Um, even like, even I like, I'm really, I'm enjoying monster theory. Like I, and I, I enjoy the dark fantastic. And I, part of the reason why I changed my dissertation was because I hadn't enjoyed reading a nonfiction in a long time. And I hadn't been excited by anything about it in a long time because it's just work and there's so much of it. And the, the way that they pressed you to produce in graduate school does not invite enjoyment 
it invites results. Um, so I like the way you have to consume it. It's like, you know, when you're in a food eating contest, you stop tasting it. You just get down to the mechanics of how you consume as much as possible. So now when I look at it, I'm just like, wow, that was a really great argument. And then I pick up a fantasy book and escape or I take a nap. So <laughs> take those take naps. Those really, really take those naps. Did I answer the question? I feel like I didn't actually hear the question. No, I feel like you answered it. I feel like you answered it. Answer the question. <laughs> the question is, I'm in grad school and I'm tired. <laughs> <laughs> the question is, I'm in grad school and I'm tired. Correct. That's a fair summary. So we've kind of touched on this a little bit, but what, what would you say is the importance of Black nonfiction authors? Like, obviously, nonfiction is like very vast. There's a whole host of subgenres in there but when you're reading and you're like if you do look for like black authors of whatever you're reading you know why do you do that um i feel for me we are in a day and age where we have to constantly prove our validity and prove that we're ma that we matter and i feel that when i am reading a fiction novel that can very much resemble themes of blackness in the way that I did. Um, I define it. Um, it's really good to have a couple books, you know, that I've read or familiar with that supports that fiction um, text. So for me, that's why it's important, or one of the reasons why it's important, because I can be like, it can kind of be like. Um, like, uh, how do I try to say it? It could be like uh, some things that I have in like my toolbox when someone's like, oh, this experience isn't real, <laughs> you know, and I like have some nonfictions to back it up. But I also feel like we're in a day and age where um, educating yourself is becoming more popular, even though people try to act like they don't want to do it. So the more access we have to these nonfiction um, black writers, it better equips us to understand the work that we have done and the work that still needs to be done. I feel like I just rambled, but. No, and I think I am just gonna be echoing you with also, um, if we're talking, if, are you talking about like in general or to us specifically? Like as you are reading nonfiction, you know, like how does that, how does it help? How does it like, like what unique perspectives, you know, are you finding that you, you don't think you would find in other authors? For me, I think um, it, or I know it helps me to articulate my position um, and to be very clear about what produces that position i think before what i think what black what black critical discourse does for everyone whether it's acknowledged or not is peel back and um peel back invisible production of meaning and positionality so in ethnography, it's it's very it used it didn't used to be a thing that you declare your position that you say I am a ex ex cis or whatever woman from here. What like you would just talk authoritatively about a group of people, and then you get um, Sweeney Madison. I'm just throwing out a name. She did not start this, but she's participating and she's a big name in ethnography. Um, Sweeney Martin. Madison. Hmm? I was saying Margaret Mead, but go ahead. So Annie Madison um, talking about how you represent people is how they're treated and being very explicit about her position as a black woman from from this whatever school of thought, like then it pushes everyone to be very clear about, and really, really I could have said Zerona Hurston. Um, if we were talking also about like, Zora, Zora, Zora. 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 Amen. Um, because even Zora. then people were like, Zora, you're singing over the natives, we can't hear them. And she's like, as soon as I come into the space, I'm impacting 
the their their native or what like their organic whatever like I'm part of I'm part of the production of this of this product at this point. So it pushes people to be honest about what your presence in a space means and to proclaim the fullness of that. I'm not an ethnographer, but that's just like an example of how like that happens in and many other feels about like just how I have this view I have this argument this argument is coming out of x here are my investments in that argument and so I think it just pushes people um not just to be like generally critical but to be specific about how you enter a space what your agenda is what your investments are um that sort of things I think that's very that's something I didn't really think about before when I was just like reading novels I didn't think about positionality as much Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think my first time really getting a, a handle or being aware of, of positionality was when I was obtaining my BA in anthropology and we had to read about Margaret Mead's work and I was just who sick. She, who is she? She's Planned Parenthood? Is that yeah. something else? No, Margaret Mead is a cultural or was known to be a cultural anthropologist who did a lot of work in Papua New Guinea. And she pretty much screwed, like she screwed up. She just really wrote a lot of stuff about the culture um, and cultures in like the worst way. And she sex she hypersexualized the culture when that's not true. She just really wrote from like what Britt was saying, an authoritative point of view and really missed the ball. But you see that often in white scholars of her time thinking that they just know everything and they are the all and be all and they just not trash, They're just trash about it. So yeah, oh, I don't know how to put point. that anyway, put that nicely. <laughs> Thanks for the correction, Britt, on the spelling. I was having trouble finding the author, and I just kind of was like, yeah. Sweetie. <laughs> um, But yeah, no. I also forgot to mention that I was really like into folklore. Well, I am still really into folklore. I'm not reading it as much right now. And I guess I don't really count that as much as nonfiction, because in a way, it feels like, a for me, I for me, it's like reading classics for fantasy and stuff right now like it's like this is like the root of a lot of what i'm seeing iterations of now for talking about like paints or like remixes on certain stories and stuff but like i mean it's i guess it is still nonfiction, and um that was something that did come up a lot was that um there was a treasury i think was annotated african-american folk tales by was it henry lewis gates jr and one other person Henry Louis Gates Jr. and uh, Maria Tatar, and um, that was something that came up frequently. Was like, who's collecting these stories, and like, how does that impact like what you know you're going to tell someone? Like, right? Um, you know, if this random like white anthropologist like pops up and is like, "Oh, hey, tell me some of your folk tales," like, what are you going to tell them? Like, how are they interacting with people? How does their worldview affect like what they're gonna write down? Like in terms of like, oh, did they decide they were gonna try and keep to how people like actually spoke, or did they like kind of transmute it into standard English? Um, in terms of just like recording like who they got it from, and like you know, if the the book had a section on Africa too, because I was talking about like you know, here are some like commonalities between different regions and stuff like that, and that was something that came up a lot. Was like a lot of the stories in that anthology that were from Africa were collected by Christian missionaries at the time. And, you know, what well, what were they doing and how were they interacting with it? And it was like very interesting talking about African-American folktales that were collected because of just even within like the African-American scholars, like all the different viewpoints on like why it was being collected and who, what was the school of thought you subscribed to? Like, were mm -hmm. you collecting it? Cause you're like, this is something we need to preserve. Or are you like collecting it? Cause you're like, this is something silly and antiquated and it's just a thing to write down and like you know it's not necessarily something we want to move forward um things like that and i don't know it's just i don't know if it was something i was really thinking of 
when I was like, I don't know, even like maybe three years ago or something. It was just like mm-hmm. how, who the person is who's writing things down influences like what questions they're going to ask, um, what information they're going to be able to get. And like, just like do, how much do I trust about what's presented and like what questions mm-hmm. I'm asking? Like, oh, do I want to like cross reference such and such information or see what other scholars have said? Um, yeah. yeah. I think I think you bring up a really good point, Chloe, about like, the people there and what they are and are not going to tell you. And in Zora Neale Hurston says this thing in her in um, her book of Mules and Men. I love that one. Okay, sorry. <laughs> no, <laughs> her titles first of all, like hidden a hidden a straight liquid a crooked stick. Like her titles for me, I'm just like, come on. Um, but in of Mules and Men, when she's talking about um, ethnographers that come in with this extractive sort of um, ethic. And she said um, of them, all right, I'll set something outside the door of my mind for him to play with and handle. He can read my writing, but he sure can't read my mind. I'll put this play toy in his hand and he will seize it and go away. And so I think the other thing is like, the people there are not ignorant to what you're doing. Um, You're not the first one. Missionaries were like early iterations of ethnographers as were collectors. and like oh like there have been many iterations of ethnographers way before anthropologists like all these different things and the people know how to handle you how to negotiate with you for resources um and what you will and won't understand like they they understand that you need them to to make meaning of their life and they mm-hmm. they keep things they keep their things that they don't want you to have and so i think the other thing is like recognizing that there are two people in that transaction there's the ethnographer and there's the 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 human subject and exactly. it's a negotiation like the book is a part of that negotiation what am i telling right. you how are you representing me being responsible to that relationship right, right. i feel like there's a neil Hurston quote about um how she felt like the black people she was interviewing were like would deal with certain people was like resistance like a pillow like sort of like a song <laughs> like you think you know what's going on, but like not really. Like right. sort of like a polite like re- misdirection or redirection. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Because something has to draw my mind for you to play with, and yep. you yep. yep. Man, I got nothing, but that was wonderful. <laughs> that was wonderful. Um, Chloe, what you just said kind of remind me of the importance for me, it's important for me to read nonfiction that discusses African-American vernacular English. Um, And when you were talking, I kept thinking about like, uh, you were talking about antiquated things. I was thinking about the way in which language has been written. And I think it's becoming more to the forefront of my mind because I've been trying to read a lot of very old mystery and like thriller that was written by um, African Americans, like in the fifties, the forties, the thirties kind of thing. So I've been really paying attention to the usage of language. And I think what really helped me um, pay attention to it is reading nonfiction, specifically this book that I cannot stop talking about until I'm black in the face called Talking Black While um, Talking Back While Talking Black, I think is what it's called. Forget the um, author's name, but that is just another reason why I think it's important for us to read black nonfiction because it can always, to me, inform the fiction that you're reading, specifically when you're looking at it from a historical point of view in which that I'm looking at it when I'm talking about the books that I've read by black um, and African-American authors who wrote mysteries in the 2030s, 40s, 50s. Brie, I scoot away so that I could show you these two books. So the first one is Killing Poetry, Blackness in the Making of Slam and Spoken Word Communities Uh by Javon Johnson. Um, And he is a professor at what he was. um, I don't know if he still is, but you know, maybe. Um, Right, (laughs) professor at Rutgers University. Um, And also, um, um, a champion slam poet. And so 
he's talking um he talks about a lot of things but you know the thing again the thing that is useful for this moment for this conversation for you um is he was talking about um he was talking about like in certain lounges like the premium put on black poets and i mean and he's not the only one that talks about it. like i've hear i i've heard a lot of poems when i was in college talking about like i give you a black boy's name and you give me a 10. um and so talking about like not just the vernacular of of um black writers and artists but the expectation that the subject is always going to be that of trauma um and so he talks a little bit about like just um what goes into making community and like black people being in white spaces and that sort of them bringing in like their content that sort of thing so you should check that out and then the other one is um Word from the Mother by Geneva Smith by Geneva Smitherman. I'll type it in the comments because I don't know if y'all can even see this, and it's definitely way backwards for you. But <laughs> I'll put it in. I'll put it in the chat. Um, and she talks. It's Word from the Mother language and African Americans, and she talks about um, AAVE, and she yeah. talks about. It's just great. I work in a writing center, and they had they had us read this. Um, but you I think you will definitely enjoy Geneva Smitherman's work, period. Um yeah. So yeah, I'll put some thank you. Thank sure. you. I mean, um one day I might become like a true polyglot. I always say that I'm like a lazy polyglot. <laughs> Just a lazy one. But I try to read um for me the languages that I I really want to try to get a whole on like understanding the way in which like um, texts and sentences and I don't know, cognates, just different things is Swahili, Russian, Ukrainian, Spanish, French, more of figuring out English. Cause sometimes I'd be like, do I even know this language? Um, and uh, I was thinking about a little bit of German, but probably not, but for sure those other languages. So. Thank you for the rec. Appreciate it. And I guess, Brie, I'm curious, because you talked about Neil deGrasse Tyson and the science side, because that's something that I'm trying to get more into. And it's, oh, Kiki had a comment. Important to read Black author nonfiction to provide counter perspectives to popular discourse and narratives. Um, but I think we've talked a little bit about position and it's just kind of like, I don't know, I feel like in science, people talk about it as like this impartial thing that like exists outside of human impulses. And I think we probably know that's really not true. Um, if, if you didn't know, um, now, you know, I guess, um, <laughs> like, I mean, you know, there are histories of racist pseudosciences being developed, like phrenology and stuff like that, um, to like, you know, back up stuff. And they there really wasn't data for it. And they're just like, we're gonna, we're gonna go with it. Um, sorry, Kiki had a comment I was reading. And it was just something I was thinking about as I was reading some of these books about animals, just like how our, like, how we think about animals influences, like what questions we ask and like, how we interpret their behavior and stuff. Like I took a, a comp comparative literature course in college as like a, a gen ed. And it was very interesting talking about like different cultural perceptions around animals. Um, I was talking specifically about the United States and China. And that was just kind of like in terms of literature, in terms of like animals as metaphor. And then it was just interesting reading um, like science fiction uh, most of the science fiction, sorry, not science fiction, science writing, like pop science writing for lay people by white authors about animals. And like, um, I was thinking specifically of one about jellyfish that was like fine on the whole. Like I like sea life. Um, the, the information was interesting, but it was just kind of like that ethnography portion that was like very strange to me because part of it involved like um, the author talking about all the places they visited and like all the different ways they're looking at jellyfish, like jellyfish just like as um, just like an animal, jellyfish as a food, jellyfish as um, a sign of environmental decline and like how does like, you know, all the changing things in the ocean affect jellyfish. And so they're talking about it on the food side and part of it involves them like 
talking with like this guy who was, I guess, a neo confederate, like had a confederate belt buckle and stuff, and like it, it was very, <laughs> very, <laughs> very strange. Like she didn't really have a whole lot to say about. It. She's like, oh, he's got a confederate belt buckle on. Isn't that odd? Isn't that peculiar? And it took her like two chapters to be like that's an issue as opposed to like, or she's talking about the stuff about the wildlife where she's like, you know, climate change is an issue. She's saying like very strong language. And then like, just talking about like, in terms of like how she's investigating and, you know, how she's even, I guess, able to navigate some of these spaces because the author is white, like how that have gone if she hadn't been. Um, it took her a lot longer and she had a lot less to say, <laughs> which was kind of just like jarring and like alienating. And the and, inversion of what it would be for, of, of what it should be. If we're talking about like the ethics, like your position should be first before you say anything else. Yeah. And how you navigated the space. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't mean to interrupt you, Chloe. Go That's on. Fine. Oh, and I was just like thinking more generally because um, I had read something really cool about cephalopods, which is also by a white author. And they were talking sort of about how, you know, different cultures have had certain like access to things. Like, um, I think they're talking about specifically like um, trying to figure out the evolution of cephalopods and like, you know, we're looking at fossils and like, why are fossils hard to find? What type of information can we get from them? And talking about, I'm blanking on it. I think it was somewhere in the Midwest. I think there's like a big like fossil area and how like, people indigenous to those areas were interacting like with like these fossils as like objects of good luck and like what they thought they symbolized and stuff like that. And just thinking about like, you know, the type of like, I don't know, it just seemed very interesting. Like I would have loved to have read more about that from someone who's more familiar with the area. Um, and sort of, I've kind of talked about, I, I think I've talked to Brie a little bit about braiding sweetgrass and kind of wondering like, what's the, you know, how have other like indigenous peoples like interacted with botany and plants? I really live in botany and plants. And like, I'm trying to find more stuff. Like, um, I'm just focusing on Nigeria because it seems like it's easier for me to find Nigerian authors, but like how have like different ethnic groups in Nigeria interacted with plant life there and stuff like that. And it's been slow going finding books, but just there's so many different ways of knowing. And like, I would there's like to so know more many. <laughs> There's so many different ways of knowing. Well, if you can just give me those recommendations to the I'm Nigerian fine, books. Along, but, um, definitely. But I'm currently in the process of doing a lot of work in regards to indigenous botany, specifically from Plains Indians where I live right now. So like Anishinaabek people. So in some Dakota and Lakota people as well. So when I find um, more books or um, if I'm allowed to share certain knowledges, I'll share with you, Chloe. Awesome. I feel like there was one other thing. I'm trying to remember. Maybe it'll come back to me at some point. Oh, uh, and also in terms of just how positionality affects the questions you ask. I had been reading this book about, um, I think they're called herbariums. It's basically a sign for scientific records. It's like you take a, a plant, I don't know if anyone's really into pressing flowers as a kid, you just like squish it with a lot of weight and you get all the moisture out. Yeah. And then you like put it between like paper or lamination or something so that people can like look at the structure and stuff for later and like maybe test the genetic material. Um, and I was just reading the book and like, this is a technique that was developed in Europe and they author talks about, you know, why was it developed in Europe? Like there are other people studying botany. Why didn't they develop this technique? And, very interesting stuff about like, you know, climate, like, you know, if you have a winter and you want to study plants, it's going to be very difficult to study them. Or if um, like seasonal stuff, like if you want to see flowers in a, in a season where it's not going to be flowering, how would you do that? Um, but then when they're talking about the United States, I was just kind of like, okay, so you've kind of, there's some like flags in the intro. I was like, I don't think they're going to deal with certain things well. Like, it's also a big part of herbariums was like um, colonization and people going and like taking a lot of stuff for like genetic material to either like try and propagate and sell as like a novelty item back in Europe or um, to just study and stuff and like all the 
I guess it was the age of enlightenment, like all the stuff happening then. Um, and they'd kind of downplayed why people might have like questions about like, I don't know, I guess why the focus on herbariums specifically. Um, but they acknowledged that colonialism happened and it was bad. And I was like, okay, <laughs> we'll see where this goes. And I was like kind of disappointed because when they got to the US, um, they didn't really mention any um, like black botanists who would have been using herbariums. And I was like, they, they mentioned George Washington Carper in passing. And I was like, and they just like kind of mentioned, oh, he sent like a sample to somebody. And I was like, you know, my thing was like, okay, herbariums are like a scientific thing. It's usually associated with universities. Um, how does like segregation and stuff affect who is going to use herbariums, how they're going to access herbariums and like all that. Um, and that hadn't, wasn't a thing that was really mentioned in the book, like how segregated education affects who's using what tools and like all that stuff and like who's going to be a scientist basically. And I like looked it up and like there are HBCUs, for example, that had herbariums. Um, I, let me find it. But there was like one that was like very, like very prominent. Yeah, I'm not finding it right away. But I know like, for example, the Howard, the Howard University has an herbarium. And I think it was like kind of like one of the bigger ones for a while. And I was like, oh, like, why isn't that here? Why isn't that a thing we could talk about a little? Because there was like very interesting stuff when I went digging. But it was just like unfortunate. It kind of felt like a dead end. It was like, you know, a Wikipedia blurb level of information about like the herbarium and like they're trying to digitize now. And you can kind of like volunteer to like digitize if you're if you're bored like me and you don't want to be on Twitter. <laughs> um, but also, I don't know. This, it was just like a lot of questions. And there's like, oh, here's like a very prominent like African American botanist. And I'm like, oh, I'd love to hear about her life. Like, let me find out more. Like, even just the way they dealt with George Washington Carver was so impassioning. It's like, but he's he's big. <laughs> right. I a book that might lean into that blind spot of theirs for you is uh, Fugitive Science by Britt Russert. Okay. Um, and I'll throw it in the chat. Um, but it's it's talking about um, a group of um, a group of I mean she's I forget the time period that she's working out of it's like early but she's talking about a group of um, black artists and how their work was refuting the racist findings of um, pseudoscience um, and so that might that might look into that area for you. Um, also, Brie, I just admire the, the fact that you gave it. I, I have that book, like, um, Astrophysics and a Hurry, something like that. I bought it with high hopes for myself. And then I got to like page three and I was like, I'm not sure what I thought this was going to be. I just but really I love it. I can't, I can't handle it, but it's so good. If, if you're, if you're into that, I wonder if you've read, um, cause this is the closest I have come or will be coming to astrophysics. I'm just not able, Everybody, everyone's just not able. Um, so it, what is it? Uh, it's Michelle Wright and it is- Michelle Wright sound familiar. Physics of Blackness. Um, physics of Blackness oh, beyond, no. beyond Middle Passes Epistemology. Oh my and God, I'm ready. It's, what is it? Physics of blackness. Physics of blackness. Yeah. Oh my god, my um, whole body is ready. My <laughs> whole body. Um, and she talks about um Michelle Wright and my excitement. I missed a T, but there's a T on the end of her name. Wow. I can't find it. You can't find it. Hold on. I can. I can email it to you. Um. <laughs> you know, you know, the feds be watching. You know, the feds be watching. I, my like my my Google Home Mini will legit be like lighting up when I'm talking on the phone about like maybe some like rocket stuff, and I'm like, Why are you listening? Why Back are you lurking? Literally lurking. Anyway, 
<laughs> but in physics of blackness, she is talking about Newton's laws of physics. She's talking about how it sets up an expectation for progress narratives and how that impacts how we think about like perfect the legacy of slavery. Like we expect that because that was then and this is now that there's a, that there's going to be progress. Now, I right. usually think about that through like um, like. I, I like previously I had only thought about that through um like Martin Luther King Jr. has this speech about like um the myth of time or something like that. Yeah. That like we think that if it goes on for long enough, then things will get better. That's not true. We yeah. end up with negative yeah. peace, whatever. So I had only thought about that from like a theological lens. Um, but she brings it back to like physics really form the basis for how we conceive temporality yeah um yeah. And, and so she talks about like moving beyond the middle passes of epistemology and thinking about time um non-linearly um well, and so she that said, is why i'm most interested in it because oh. listen i'm i just maybe it's because i've been influenced heavily by anishinaabic people but when i listen to different belief systems and different teachings and the way time is being described is never linear. So that is one of the big reasons why I'm so drawn to reading um, physics. And also I love black holes. So we can talk about black holes until I am blue in the face, event horizons, that's my shit. But, that I, but I get what you're saying. <laughs> I thought you were talking about the, the literary essay, Black Holes. And I was like, when did you have a, a reason to read that? Um, but it's talking about black female sexuality. But I was like, okay, oh, sure. No, no. Okay. Black holes. I'm with, okay, all right. About, um, <laughs> no, black holes. But now I'm starting to get really interested in white holes. And then those? I'm getting a little like angry. Huh? What, what are those? So white holes is like, um, have a, from what I know, have a different like polarity than black holes, but then I don't know much about it, but I'm like trying to get into it. But then I'm also freaking out about if the earth is too close to two big black holes and them conjoining together and like sucking us in. So it's just, it's a lot. So I'm just like freaking out about the size of black holes and how close we are to them. Wait, are we close to any? I thought they're all kind of... Um, they could be. But oh, well, wait, we can't really see them, right? We only see them by like absence. Yeah. So, you know, the struggle is real. I'm not an astrophysicist at all, but I do freak out about certain things. Well, thank you for bringing that to the table. So now we all know that if at any moment you feel like you're ceasing to exist, it is because we have stumbled into a black hole. But listen, there's this there's this woman, she's an astrophysicist. I think she's a white woman, but she talks about like your best survival if you ever get near a black hole. And it's so funny because her and um, Neil deGrasse Tyson were talking about it. And it was just hilarious. But anyway, I'm moving on to How the- How do you survive? I, I've only seen Treasure Planet. You like tie yourself <laughs> down to the ship, right? And you hope that the guy with the scorpion hands doesn't cut your rope. <laughs> No, she was like, you need to go in and you need to go in fast as hell. And I'm like, what are we? We don't have like those like um, those packs that just like, you know, can fire you up. There we go. But anyway, I'm just so fascinated with black holes. Like, wow. Like the way we won't survive it. Like we couldn't. We would just turn into whatever. <laughs> like this. We're giving everyone a <laughs> <laughs> But but we wouldn't know, right? Like we would just cease to be. Yeah, but it would be like a painful death. Oh, you really? Slow, yeah, you were slowly turn really? into just molecules. Because oh, time changes. You will like deatomize. Yeah. Like slowly. Chloe, Chloe, can you can you move us to the next topic? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not equipped. It's so good okay. though. It's the, good as in positive or good as in I just I just love reading like, about it. I'm love reading about it. And I love that my roommate indulges me and um we listen to the podcast, Neil deGrasse podcast together. Well everybody I mean, needs a friend. Everybody needs a friend and every and every ministry they're gonna bless. You need a partner. It's just so I have every 
I've read every book by Neil deGrasse Tyson except Cosmic Queries. I'd be, I'm a stalker. I'd be like, oh my God, when's the next one coming out? You really need to do a series on your channel where you where you share that with people and break it down because like I'm, I literally, I just can't access the language and the ideas. But it's if you true. really get it, I sure. think it's only because I spent a lot, a long time in biology and physics and absolutely not. I do. And a lot of my friends are astrophysicists, so and like work for NASA. So I'm constantly being like, hey, <laughs> can we talk about this? <laughs> Just have one more question. OK. OK. <laughs> I think you're lying, but go ahead. I feel like you have at least two questions. It's never just one. Exactly. I feel like they're like, I know that you have three, but go on. It's just, it's just so good. And then like, I, then Neil deGrasse Tyson has such a beautiful way of bringing like black humor into his books. Like one of my favorite ones that was really funny was Pluto Five. Poop. Pluto files because he was getting letters from like four year olds accusing him for declassifying declassifying Pluto as a planet and reclassifying it to a dwarf um, like asteroid or some sort. And then so he goes into detail about this committee and these people who decide rather something is a planet, a dwarf planet, an asteroid, a comic, whatever the fuck. So he was just going into details about it. He was like, I can't believe Jimmy and North Carolina would write me this. So it was just so funny. So anyway, now next, next question, Bob, I will never stop talking about it. So I got to shut up. Hold on a second. Can we just sit with the fact that four-year-olds are writing letters? I mean, I would. I don't have a lot of faith in the American educational system, but something is going right. A lot of middle schoolers and elementary um, students are mad at Neil deGrasse Tyson because he was the first one to publicly state that Pluto is no longer a planet, and he got mm -hmm. lots of letters about it. Oh, I thought you said four-year-olds, not yeah, four. Yeah, no, four-year-olds too. Like they were writing shit on behalf of their parents like you got on behalf of their parents no sorry their parents were helping them write oh, okay. oh okay i was were. like you got your four-year-old being <laughs> your secretary come on now break this down break this down right like what i'm like four-year-olds is mad but you know i remember my niece being real pissed about things but not that passionate you know about a planet but you know whatever four-year-olds have stamp money they do <laughs> They got their little piggy jar. They're getting, they've been collecting their coin over the years. Think about this letter for a long time, Neil. Let's have a talk. Yeah, I feel like I freak people out in the comments. I'm sorry. Okay, it's next. It's not question. a feeling. We have we have factual <laughs> evidence that they are very very anxious. I'm just so interested about the cosmos and Andromeda, our our nearest uh, galaxy. I don't I don't want it to come in contact with us. Cause that shit is gonna be the big bang on crack. <laughs> Just saying. Chloe, take us up. Chloe, <laughs> let's do a video on your favorite uh, physics books. Oh man, we'll be there forever. You should. <laughs> um, so I was just wondering in general, um, thinking about like, Okay, I just wanted to complain about how hard it is to find some of these nonfiction books and how much money they cost. But I was also like, let, let, let's be more generative. Let's be more, let's try and be more positive here. So let's think of like hacks. Um, so I was wondering like, um, how do you feel like black authors of nonfiction are usually engaged are like by readers or by reviewers? Are there some like, genres of nonfiction where they're easier to find than others and like how do you go about finding like uh, black authors of nonfiction that are like new to you um and how do you get a hold of them because some of these books are pricey <laughs> yeah so um i think doing some backlists ain't never helped you i never ain't i mean doing backlisted books ain't never not good for you um the new releases are great but i think trying to get some of that stuff that came out years ago of like thrift books and stuff. It's like your best bet. Um, for me, I'm just always creeping on something. So I can't really tell you specifically how I'd be finding my um, black nonfiction books, but uh, there is always a way 
uh, rather legally or <clears throat> to get the book that um, that you need, if if you know what I'm putting out. Some nonfiction books even come with like a like condensed pamphlet. <laughs> It'll be like, oh, here are some um, quick notes of like what the book was. So sometimes that is like way cheaper than other things. Um, a lot of I have one of my friends. He um, teaches. African American studies at uh, the University of Minnesota, and his collection is wonderful. And he only has black nonfiction. That's all he reads. That is all he reads. So I'm constantly being like, "Yo, let me come check out your stuff." So some stuff I just like go into um, his collection and get stuff. Uh, another thing is um, a lot of times. You can get recommendations. Like I've gotten recommendations from uh, Storygraph. It'll be like, if you like this, you'll like these. So um, that's really helped. Thrift book is really, really the plug out here in these streets. Amazon trying to get you to sell your first um, child for show, for show. Um, you they can gouge uh, the prices on some of those they, books. Some of those books will be like fifty bucks, and you go to the website for the press, and it's like twenty five. It's just like not okay. Um, also. There are um, students, so like sometimes I'll find, I'll just do nonfiction books um, in a Facebook marketplace, Hair Code is Hack, and there are students who are just selling their books for just the low, low. So I'll just go and um, get some of those books. Also, you can be a thief. No, I'm just kidding. I was just joking. I was just joking there. But you can definitely um, find your books. You know, there is a will, there is a way is the um, old Southern, uh, what is it, saying? So that is pretty much where I find books. Also, don't sleep on Target. Don't sleep on Target sales. They be really coming out. I got stamped from the beginning that thick, 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 thick as book for like $10 because of a sale one time. So don't sleep on Tarjay, don't sleep on Tarjay. Also, if you are out here in the BookTube community, Bookstagram community, add them non-fictions to your um, wish list because maybe some white person is gonna buy for you and I call it reparation through literature, amen? So definitely go ahead and use those options. Mm -hmm. Oh, sorry. Kiki brought up that, like, some, like, if you have an old, like, university, some of them will allow, like, the public or the alumni to have library cards. Because, like, I know my library doesn't have, like, I don't know, some of these, like, more, like, literary criticism texts where it's, like, a bajillion footnotes and, like, more academic, like, my public library doesn't have that stuff. Um, but also that, Kiki's also bringing up that some of the libraries also suck on the way you do that. <laughs> Also, your librarian, like, so for for this, um, my library didn't have it, but my best friend is also a librarian and worked there, and I was like, hey. So I was able to get this in, like, two weeks. So you can actually, but even if you don't have a best friend who's a librarian, you can ask your library, hey, I want this book. They order for you, and you check it out. Sorry, I was hunting down middle passage epistemology for Brie because I typed it in and my university library was like, we don't know what that is. And I was like, a lie. So then I had to challenge them. Um, but anyway, I'm multitasking. Uh, here's the thing. I'm not going to be helpful. I'm just not because a lot of the things that I read are behind paywalls like um, JSTOR. And I have access to it through my university. And since I'm going into the academy in some form or, fa or fashion, whether it be a university writing center or into a university classroom, um, or even a private high school, like they're fancy enough to have these things as well. So I don't, I have never had to, by the time I was having to read these things, I had this access because I wouldn't be reading it otherwise, let me be very clear. Um, so I'm not gonna be very useful in being like, oh, here's the hack because I'm just like, give me this thing. And they're like, okay, here you go. Um, so listen to what Bree said. And in the meantime, I will be 
and emailing brief for things that she can't find. And that's just how it goes. So that's you on know. what? And that's on what Mary had a little lamb. Amen. <laughs> what we're saying is you find someone to bless you and you allow them to bless that ministry. Okay. It's called Hood Economics 3.0. <laughs> Period. <laughs> Period. You always know someone inside the house. Let the call come from inside the house and then have them what? Text it to you. Amen. Amen. Go on. Amen. Amen. <laughs> oh, you said that JSTOR is letting people um, access 99 free articles a month right now. Hey, that's game changing really? information. Wow. Say less. I didn't know that. I've been out here just like, I wish I was a student so I could have access to this again. And physics of blackness is on JSTOR. That's where I finally found it, even though my university tone is lies. Wow. But it's on JSTOR. Here I go. <laughs> now, why did I think about the Mario? Here I go again, you know? Here I go again. Mm -mm -mm. Treated me ungratefully. Mm -mm -mm -mm. That's all I got for you folks. But you know, uh, you said it's not everything, but it's a wider variety than you could get pre pandemic. Oh, so. oh, is this because of the pandemic? Yeah. yeah, I remember someone had opened stuff up, but I couldn't remember who it was. Well, in case you don't have access to it, Brie, I'm sending you an email with non disclosed materials. And okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I really like this conversation, by the way. Wholesome. I'm hearing you talk about black holes and white holes <laughs> and how we're all going to die. It's not even that. Don't get me talking about our environment, y'all. I haven't found any good books that I just been listening to a lot of like black women who are um, working towards sustainability and like biodegradable things and it's just been like blowing my mind god damn but anyway once i find some literature it's over are there like genres where you feel like it's easier to find like black authors writing nonfiction as opposed to others like i feel like the literary criticism is like okay um I feel like, like if I'm, I don't know, because like for me, I kind of have a system for like finding like genre fiction, and I felt like it really didn't translate over well to finding nonfiction. Like I usually, I usually like look for like awards, and I kind of like go through, and then from there, I kind of like find like more specialized awards, and then um, sometimes people will kind of have like networks. So like if I follow like one author, they'll be boosting other authors, and I'm just it's not really happening so much with like the nonfiction sphere. Um, yeah. There's a lot more trial and error, it feels like. Yeah. Like, I'm just going to the Goodreads Choice Awards. I'll be like, oh, that book about earthworms looks cool. But like almost none of the stuff that I'm very drawn to will be by a black author. Um, it seems like the memoirs and like the anti-racist <laughs> stuff is like, okay. But other than that, it's been a little hard for me. I mean, yeah, right. Right. I think it's, I think slave narratives, and things about race and gender is easily accessible for um, black nonfiction than any other type of topic. Because, and like sexual trauma too. Oh, wrong. Kathleen says, even if you graduate like as an alum, you might still be able to use the student portal for articles. I think I'm my issue is I'm not, not specialized. I can't, I'm not trying to teach myself <laughs> undergrad <laughs> biology so I can read the, the article about the cephalopods. I just don't think it's realistic. It'd be like that. Saw a stack of books, Britt. What's the word? I know. Tell us the juice. Here's the thing, when you live in a town, an apartment that's basically like its own little municipality of books, you can see the cover in your mind, but you don't know whether it's zoned to <laughs> A or B, or if the mayor is pink or green. Like, it's just very difficult to know where you're supposed to be. Yeah. Uh, so I was looking for um, red, white, and in color. Yeah. 
Portent's Pillars. I've, I've heard of that. Yeah, Portent's I haven't read Portent's it. Pillars, I feel like I'm wrong. Don't get me with. Don't make me lie about the author. Listen, that's why I was looking for it because I was like, all I can see, Sister Mine, is the pinkness of the cover. <laughs> that's really, and I just, I know, I will think of it later and tell you. But collections. So, um, because. Only a certain amount of people can win an award, no matter how good the book is. So, um, and especially again. to what Brie was talking about with like backlist things that are going to be so much more affordable and that you're going to get so much for your book. These essays, the essay game is where you should try to position mm. yourself. That's um, what I was saying earlier. Yes. And so all of these are African-American literary, literary criticism because that's my background and that's my um research so just know that but um this is like 1999 or something african-american literary theory is edited by winston pierre and it has everyone in here from wb du bois like a 19 um like 06 article or something like it because it's um it's also letting you get an idea of what the, what were the concerns of, of the field of the time and so like right. it starts with the 1920s the 1960s and it goes forward so it starts with du bois i don't know who it ends with i've had this since college since literally college and it continues to be um super helpful um and i think it ends around the 1970s but then you know you, you can start with here and it has like literally over 50 essays in it um right it is definitely like, a chonker kiki yes yeah. it is you know and then this um reading black reading feminism a critical anthology edited by um henry lewis gates jr so there's that and then another one edited by henry lewis gates jr is Black literature and Black literary theory. Um, so that, like, and these are probably like $10 at this point because they're old. Um, but they have so much in them and they have seminal essays like Mama's Baby Papa's Maybe by Hortense Spillers. Oh. She, I mean, the name, the name alone. So Black literary and uh, literature and literary theory is $6.89. On thrift books. Am I adding it to the cart? Amen. Amen. If the Lord is trying to bless you, then who are we to close our Who fences? are we to turn it down? I don't <laughs> I don't have that kind of gall. That's just me. <laughs> um, but I have found anthologies are really, really good places to go. Also, what is it? Uh Barbara. Who wrote The Salt Eaters? Because her name is like- a Oh, Tony King Bombara. Thank you, Bombara. That's what I was like, Bombara. Barbara, that feels wrong. So I wasn't correcting you. My mind was just catching up with this. Um, she edited an anthology called The Black Woman. Oh, oh yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Seminal. Um, and it's time. So, I mean, still. So foundational. So that also has like a lot of different essays. Um, places where I'm, I may not have seen that essay in another place. There's also one on hip hop feminism. Um, it's somewhere over here. When I tell you like where I am, it's is a it place John Morgan? I'm just googling. She has a that's when Jamie had come home to roost. So okay. she had that's a that's a, a book. Um, when Chicken Has Come Home, Drew is a hip, -hop, a hip hop feminist, breaks it down. That is somewhere over there, but I feel like I'm getting too much exercise, so I'm not going to go fetch it. Dang, but that's not the too much exercise. I mean, I went for a walk with my old landlord and her dog, so uh -huh. before I came. So this scooting back and forth situation, my thighs aren't being engaged or anything, but, you know, they might be if I do it two more times. So I'm just going to ration those out. Um yeah, but this is Homegirls Make Some Noise, Hip Hop Feminism Anthology. Um, and the four word is by Mark Anthony Neal. So like, that's just four right there where it's like, these anthologies are made to collect this knowledge to situate you into a conversation. Yeah. And I, I see people in anthologies who I may not have read their work anywhere else. And so it's a really good place to, um, if you want to get into the discourse, within the discourse, yeah. like anthologies are great for curating that conversation. Is so great. good. I cannot echo that any, like any higher praise. I feel like if you are trying your best 
to read more nonfiction, specifically black nonfiction, mm-hmm. get yourself as many anthologies as possible. Absolutely. So you can kind of figure out what's out there, one, and what mm-hmm. kind of theories or subjects you want to play, you want to pay more attention to. So definitely, I mean, that's, I mean, we're talking about fiction, but that's why I love that book, Black Noir, and I like talk about it all the time because it really helped me get a good eye opening into what's out there. Also, Paula L. Woods, who is a mystery and crime Black writer, and she's been writing for a very long time. Um, she has lots of good anthologies that she has created that is just a collection of Black and African American um, mystery, thriller, and crime writer. So it's just really good for you to read those type of books so you can find out who you like, who writing style you like. You know, it's just, oh, I can't even, it's just so great. Um, also, I came across this book that I wanted to say that I think I want to read. And I don't know if you read it, Britt or Chloe. It's called um, Dark Sky Rising, Reconstruction and the Dawn of Jim Crow by Harry Louis Gates Jr. Oh, with nice. Tanya Bolden. That seems great. No, sorry. There's so many interviews I like, and then this was a more thought out. The colors make it really difficult to see. It's it's a whole thing. Anyway, um, yeah. no, I have not. What's that? What's that one about? Um, it's talking about reconstructing the dawn of Jim Crow. Uh, it was written with Henry Louis Gates because you talked about Henry Louis Gates mm-hmm. and um, Tanya Bolden, and it's saying here. Um, this is a story about America during after Reconstruction, one of the history most pivotal and misunderstood chapters. In a string account of emancipation, the struggle for citizenship and natural, national reunion, and the advent of racial segregation, and the renowned Harvard scholar delivers a book that is illuminating and timely, with real-life accounts drive the narrative spanning the half-century between the Civil War and the birth of a nation. So, I mean, my academic brain is like, yes, but my leisure brain is like, run. So it really like depends. Another book on Jim Crow, I mean, this is specifically um, talking about black women, um, but it's called No Mercy Here, Gender Punishment and the Making of Jim Crow Modernity. Yeah, by um, Sarah Haley. So, um, I will also go a step further, uh, not step further, but in that same um, vein. So, I have a master's in forensic psychology, and a, a book that I read that really sits with me to this day is The New Jim Crow by um, Michelle Alexander. So, um, and it talks about um, how our system is set up and how it's influenced. Um, and when I say system, I mean being incarcerated as a black person and how that um, is set up and the similarities that it pairs with um, Jim Crow and, you know, was it laws? Like, what, what was it that he set up? It was like this book. I can't remember right now, but y'all know what I'm saying. Cool. There's a whole library of recommendations in this chat right now. For real. <laughs> we went heavy with the recommendations, but I'm 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 happy for it. <laughs> yes. I mean, take what you what you need, leave what you don't. But you can't say you didn't have food in the fridge. Amen. All things are ready. Come to okay. the feet. Okay. All right. Amen. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But I, I do have quite a few. I'm like thinking if anyone needed them, but I'll have to like go and look into my catalog of nonfictions that focus on um, black men, some black women incarceration experience in our American system. Because that's something I'm also interested in. Yeah, carceral studies for sure. I mean, if J store is opening the gates, then just go in there and literally just put in the search bar carceral studies. Not the gate. Open yeah. the gates of heaven. Let it rain. It's a sermon. Let it rain. Hey, you can anything can be a sermon if you listen right now. It's a sermon. 
Yeah. Alex, I'm not sure if you had a recommendation around the book around about incarceration. Yeah. Oh. Angels with Dirty Faces. Okay. By Walida um M M Marisha. Cool, cool, cool. Yeah. Thanks, Tony. Um, I think we've talked a lot about literary analysis books, recommendations. We've talked a lot about history. Um, do you have any like memoirs that you're really feeling? Right? Oh my god, say less. Oh, did you want to go, Britt? I was going to say absolutely not. So Britt, oh. please take it away. My God, my God. Absolutely. Okay. We're going to need more wine. Gabriel Union loved it. I thought you were saying we're gonna need more wine. I was no, like, no, 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 no. It's the title. It's so okay. good. I really liked Michelle Obama's Becoming. Um, there's another book. Uh, oh my God, what is her name? Streeter? Is that her? Something Streeter. It's about her experience dating a, um, not dating, being married to a white Jewish man, and he died. And oh, man, oh my God. I can't, I, Streeter is, is the last name, but I can't get the title of it right now. Also, um, my latest, uh, memoir-ish book, um, is this one. I cried, I cried, I cried, I cried so hard. It's called Big, Fem Big Friendship, How We Keep Each Other Close. It's about um, Amina Tau, Amina Sao and Ann Friedman. So they have a, podcast together called Call Your Girlfriend. So Amina Tao is black and Anne is white. So they talk about their um, relationship being um, an interracial friendship, which is like a lot of my friendships and talk about um, like Anne whiteness in regards to Amina's blackness and how it affect their friendship and their business. So this was like really good for me. Who did you say um, the authors were for that one? Uh, oh my god, I almost beat myself up with the book. So I'll just put it here. Okay, I think I got it. Um, anything by Roxane Gay, riveting. Anything by I really loved Hunger. Um, there's also uh, Sonia. No, no, that's not a that's not a memoir. I'm trying to think. Dang, I have I read a lot of memoirs, and for right now, it I'm I'm going blank for some reason because I really like reading memoirs. Um, my God, when I think of some more, because I like went blank getting so excited about it. Um, oh, one of my fate, one of my favorites. Um, my favorite Maya Angelou book, Me, Mom, and Me, Mom, and You, or Mom, Me, and You. Hold up, I have it right here. Let me get it. We turn this around. Mom and me and mom loved it by Maya Angelou. Um, I would say that Amanda Seals' book *Small Doses* is a memoir of sorts. It's a lot of. It's a, pretty much about her life and how she made emphasis on certain things, but it is heavily rooted in Afri African American literature studies because that's what she has her master's in so you can definitely see it coming from that the those theories and those lenses um kiki recommended lose your mother a journey along the atlantic slavery by sidia b hartman yes i've heard of that book haven't read it yet Is born a crime i heard was good too i'm not sure uh, I, just I, mean, saw I, don't think your, I mean yes i've read that but i don't think lose your mother is a memoir though like i i think of it more as ethnography if anything like ethnographic because she's just talking about her journey there and like tracing like seeing the slave castles and tracing the journey across the atlantic yeah uh, there's also Lee another memoir that i read oh what'd you say sorry uh, i was just saying kathleen recommended trevor noah's memoir yeah mm -hmm. also make me want to holler it's trigger warning Okay. I just really want you to be prepared for that. That was a very eye-opening um, memoir. Also, The Sun Doesn't Shine. Uh, is it that what it's called? The Sun? Hold on. Something about the sun does shine. Hold on. Uh, 
Yeah, The Sun Does Shine by Anthony Ray Hinton. That was pretty hard. Um, I really like that memoir as well. Um, um, oh my God, uh, Men We Reaped by, um, by Jasmine War was fantastic. Uh, I'm really thinking, y'all. I'm sorry I don't have a, I can't like think, but I, I do read a lot of memoirs and I'm like. Oh, mm. Catherine recommended a graphic novel series, March by John Lewis. Oh yes, yes. My friend trying to call me. I'm like, I'm trying to discuss real stuff right now. Um, uh, if people, it's a shorter one, but Broken Places and Outer Spaces, Finding Creativity in the Unexpected by Nadia Korkor. Um, mm -hmm. It's about the time when um, she was like a college athlete and I think she had scoliosis and she had to get surgery and she was on temporarily paralyzed and it like started her writing journey. Yeah, it was pretty severe. Mm. She's like, there's only supposed to be like a one percent chance or something ridiculous of that happening, and it happened. Oh. And um, it was about like her experience, like basically eventually being able to like regain like I guess mobility in her lower body, and like that inspired her to start writing. And so like how she started writing and all that it was very interesting. It's also a very short book for people who are pressed for time. Okay. Yeah, I'm trying to. Ooh. You can also go on to a different one because I, I kind of had it broken down by some of the ones I had in my, uh, my Goodreads. Um, yeah. I'm also wondering if there's like any like self-help or like how-to books that you've enjoyed or found useful. Um... They're not, they're not self-help in the typical way in which westernized defined it for me. So one of them is a book I just finished a couple days ago. It's called, um, oh my God, I just pulled it up on accident and I thought maybe it would show. Hold on. It's called uh, Black Girl Call Home. Yeah, I... I'm telling y'all, I can't, it was, it was just phenomenal. Like I just don't even, wow. All the escalates, uh, all the, uh, the, the accolades. Um, another book that I would think is I would, I typically use black women who write poetry as self-help for me <laughs> typically, because it just be hitting the nail and just like so restorative to me. So Make Me Rain, Poems and Prose by Nikki Giovanni, Dear Black Girl by Tamara Winfrey Harris. Um, yeah, so those are anything like um, I Know Why the Cage Bird Sing. I mean, that's one that's familiar for people. For me, I thought that was very um, self-help for me, but just not in a typical way in which we view it. Um, I use a lot of work, like articles that uh, Kimberly Crenshaw has written, um, who theorize intersectionality. Um, so I use a lot of work that other people has done, because a lot of people have created um, models based on her work or expanded her work. So just finding and educating myself more on those things is a form of self-help but not nothing specifically that's like this, this, and that. And I'm sure I have something, but I'm like blanking on it. Um, but yeah. I think I, well, I have one that I enjoyed. Um, let me find it. Uh, is it the, no, it's wrong. Oh, okay. So it's not really self-help, it's more of a how-to. Um, Farming Well Black by Leah Penniman. Mm -hmm. um, um it's kind of a uh, straightforward uh it's like a mix of a lot of things so it's kind of like practical like gardening advice um on like different like setups like if you want to do raised beds or like there are things called like hubbles where it's like kind of like a, a mound of dirt and you kind of work like that um 
and it's it just like covered so many different things because it covered some of the history of like um i guess black people in america and like land sovereignty and like policy and stuff and like it was very practical in terms of like um like grants that you could possibly look for if you're like starting a business and stuff like that um recipes and it also had like a spiritual component because mm -hmm. i think um the author is spiritual um i forget forgetting the denomination but it's like a west african spirituality that i'm completely blanking on and i was kind of talking about like how that informs her um her farming practice mm -hmm. that's something i enjoyed um is there anything that you're looking forward to reading you can't necessarily recommend it yet because you haven't read it but something that you think is like a thing to look out for um i actually did a video about that too today uh <laughs> well, stay tuned yeah um i'm really looking forward to finishing pleasure activism the reason why i haven't really got into a lot of the stories is because it's big on sexual trauma. And I'm like, not quite ready for that. And then Black Fatigue, I really want to finish Black Fatigue soon by Mary Frances Winters. So um, there's also going to be a talk I was invited to um, just be, not be a part of the panel, but um, there was this talk I was um, just sent today and it talks about it was like the title was like we're tired <laughs> and it was like a talk about black fatigue by black mental health professionals and I'm like exactly I'm exhausted I mean I love what I do I love what I do but I see a lot of clients every day Monday through Friday so sometimes I feel bad because I'm not as like active on book two because I, the energy I have is zero. It is done. It was taken, <laughs> you know, like it's, it's very difficult for me to, um, constantly engage in doing trauma and healing work with other people and then just feel kind of drained after. Um, but I love what I do. It's just, I'd be tired y'all. That's all. I forgot. I missed some comments. Um, Kathleen recommended uh, a memoir, Left to Tell by Immaculate Billy Big sorry, Billy Bagiza about the Rwandan Holocaust. Um, Kiki recommended a poetry book, uh, Teaching My Mother How to Give Birth by Warson Shire. Oh, wow. Okay. Man, so many good books that's been recommended today. And so many I didn't know. I think for me, because I'm really, I've, I read, I'm reading Searching for Cigarax, Body Read with Brit, and this is good so far. And I said I'm trying to read four this year, so if we're talking about the other three. Searching what? Um, Searching for Cigarax. It's like um, media studies and criticism. It's about Black women in contemporary horror. So there's a little bit about... Um, what their appearance in like uh comics and film there's some on um novels uh yeah so i'm only chapter in but i've enjoyed I'm it gonna, how do you spell the last name i mean the last thing uh Cigarax? Cigarax. yeah how do you spell S -Y -C -O -R -A -X. It? i'll throw it in the uh the comments Oh, how dare you thrift books talking about some out of stock. Oh, no. Where did no. y'all get your copy? My I, library. All right, say less. That's all I was complaining about prices. I got it from the press. Yeah, say less. <laughs> the ebooks weren't even cheaper. The e I would literally just be saving on shipping. The ebooks was the same as the paperback. No. Bree. Huh? Do you want it? Yep. Because you know JSTOR has it. So I'm going to have to send you another email of non disclosed okay. content. Which literally okay. I just said, you're going to get so many emails from me today with non disclosed content. I will never not be grateful. 
Amen. Um, but I don't think of Joe Store. I don't know Joe Store. Yoga after this. Yeah, you about to get on down. Um, what am I looking forward to reading? Listen, I don't know. I'm still. Re- I have a lot of things that I have to read, whether I'm looking forward to them or not. That's what. <laughs> <laughs> that's what's true. Um, as I look around me, I'm going to have to reread this Ada Levy Huston How to Read African American Literature. Um, I'm gonna have to read further Monster Theory by Jeffrey Cohen. Um, this was from like 1996. They have more recently released Zombie Theory, so obviously I'm gonna have to go into that. That's like 2018 or 2020. Because weren't you just asking for some zombie, black zombie representation? Yes. Okay, yep. so yeah, you're gonna have to read that. Sorry. Yeah, I know. I mean, I was talking about in liter in like literature, but this this is like the critical literature. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, which it is what it is. And then like speculative blackness, the future of race and race studies by Andre Carrington. Mm-hmm. Um, and then just a, a, a smattering, a survey of things from Isaiah Lavender because I've seen his name come up. And oh, I have the, I have some of his stuff on my TBR. Did he write the one about what proto Afrofuturism? Listen, don't give me the lion. I said a survey. And don't give race. me the lion. Let me let me see. I know I have it in my Goodreads. Let me see if I can pull it up. Oh, also just randomly because. I can't stop talking about anthologies. There's an anthology that I really want, but I haven't been able to find it. So maybe I can thrift books, like I have it for a second and then somebody will buy it. But um, it's called Shades of Black, Crime and Mystery Stories by African-American Authors. And I like, I like need, need, need. So that, um, and it's edited by Eleanor Taylor Bland, who is like a prolific African American crime and um, mystery writer. So anyway, that's my TED talk. <laughs> oh my god! It is jamming. What's jamming? My roommate jamming. Hey Amen. Get it. Um. What am I looking for for you, Bree? I feel like I'm supposed to be doing something. Was it? Was Start it searching the- for yes. Syracuse? Not Syracuse. Oh, Syracuse. The grass. Okay, Syracuse. You know, I'm a, y'all know I can't be saying everything correct. I mean. <laughs> um, Britt, I know that I failed you. What our buddy read, our first buddy read, I failed you. I failed you because I think I forgot. So I think that's really what happened. But I ask that you bring me in your... Um, good graces so that we can read nonfiction together when it is not something that is required. But if it is something that's required and it's cool, let me know. <laughs> so if you're asking for a time when it's not required, you're asking me to put you on hold for at least two years. First off, I just feel like you have a lot of books already that I want to read with you, even though it's required. So just send me the text. <laughs> I don't. Ha- I don't have your number, but I can Instagram you. Yeah, um, Instagram is that what kids say? Instagram you. Instagram. Um, yeah, and then the other thing is, since you're gonna, you know, put our business out here in these digital tube streets, I had to find out that you was over here reading this book by your lonesome on the Bird app. Wait, which book? I don't even. Oh, it was. She's doing this. Yagi uh, tradition, transcending kingdom. Yeah, on the bird app. It was when really- When you were posting your review, I said, where? <laughs> it, it just, it was the disrespect uh, for me. That's what, just, it, that's what it got me. I mean, I'm just I like, we just come, go not talk about it. We just gonna put the review out there. I am fully, fully acknowledging it. There's also, oh my God, everything is falling. There's also this book Black that I, and Jerry already read it, so I can't ask her uh, to buddy read it, but um, it's called, I want to ask Chloe if you wanted to buddy read the book with me. Hold on. It's called Illuminescent Threads. Oh, right. That's have the anthology, that? right? Yeah. Have you read that? I haven't read it yet. All right, let's plan that as a buddy read at some point of our lives. Let's let's have that read by the end of the year. 
there. So I finally found the, <laughs> I think Goodreads went down for a second on my internet, it's just garbage. But uh, the Isaiah Lavender book was Afrofuturism Rising, Literary Prehistory of a Movement. Yeah, that's, I think that's on my, again, quadrants. So all the books in here, well, the books on my desk are their own township. These are books that are for the dissertation, but not this chapter. And then the books on the shelf, I don't have to talk to them right now. So the Isaiah Lavender is on the like active dissertation shelf, which is clear across my house. Um, with a different area code and everything. So I know I have an Isaiah Lavender book and that sounds familiar. So I think I have that one. We can both read it if you want to, because, you know, goodness knows. Just let me know when you just send me a text. I know. About, wait, did you want to read the Isaiah Lavender or did you say something else? No, I'm saying we can read that too. I'm just saying I need buddy reads because I'm not reading. I'm in the worst slump of my life and I can't read. So Here's I need I'm other not reading either. That's the gotcha. Huh? Except the gotcha is I'm not reading either. Yeah, it's just rough. You know, it's I've been rough. out here, I've been reading the same book for about two months, and I'm like, girl, let's be done. You got a page left. You have a page left. Really? So, yeah, it's you real can't bad. Get that page read it to your class. Oh my god, I can't even do it. I can't do it. But I will say, there's just a lot of changes going on in this life. Personally, I talk about it in my video. Y'all gonna see me ranting. But anyway, um, another book I'm looking forward to is nonfiction. Uh, this is Major by Shayla Lawson. It's notes on Diana Ross, Dark Girls, and Being Dope. Period. Yeah. Also, Brie, I mean, and this might also help you get out of your slump, but I'm also just speaking to I'm you. Struggling. So, especially if you're talking about nonfiction, truly read some essays. Really? Like, yeah, um, because like trying to read the books, like even if you know you're only going to read the intro and the chapter, it's just the optics of the situation that you're like, there's a book in my hand, as opposed to there's an essay of 20 pages in my hand. Right. So accordingly, right. rather than sending you an undisclosed email with possibly book-length contents in it, um, Kenitra Brooks, who wrote Searching for Sticker Racks, again, they'd be writing on these topics before they published a book. She has an essay um, that she published several years before the book called The Importance of Neglected Intersections, Race and Gender in Contemporary Zombie Texts and Theories. I'm going to need that. that. Yeah. That's um, wild. That's the first chapter of the book. Exactly. <laughs> this nonfiction <laughs> writing is a whole different beast from genre fiction. I'm trying I don't to tell you. Stand it at all. <laughs> no, usually authors, especially if they're like uh, very academic, they've already wrote like mm -hmm. they're. It's they just put it into a book, but they've already exactly. wrote that shit. They've already published it. I'm trying to tell you some like. <laughs> That's that it's the hustle game. That's why I'm like, you ain't about to get me out here looking crazy reading pages one through 255 when I can find that in an assortment of articles elsewhere. And also, homeboy over there talking about that this is Du Bois and that wouldn't even end the text. It's all I'm game, looking at bro. you, Eva Max Kendi. <laughs> I'm looking at you. What I'm saying is only a hit dog collars. <laughs> and that's on what? Mary had a little lamb. Amen. <laughs> For the audience, I'm just laughing along to pretend that I get it. I don't know what's going on in this place. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, I'm just hosting, but you know, I don't I don't have any control. Yeah. Oh, Colby says they have to head out. They said bye. Hi, Colby. Thank you for always coming. Colby B on time. Present and accounted for. Uh, you know, it's 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 the showing up in consistency for me. We love consistency. Oh, Kiki mentioned Black on Both Sides by C. Riley Snorton. Hey, transracial history. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, that one, hold up. I, I've kind of been a little scared of it because I heard like it's very academic and I, yeah. Well, like, I have to get. I just don't know how long it's going to take me to get through it. Read the introduction. So. <laughs> 
now I know. I feel snookered. All these years, I've been like, I have to read the whole thing, and I have oh, to pay thirty movie. bucks a book, and you're telling me I could have gotten it for free on. Not all the time you have to. I mean, there's a there's a lot of books on my shelf. Like I I tend to fully read the nonfiction, but not listen. If I was in school with Brit, what Brit is talking about is what I did. You thought I was gonna read that book fully? Oh, hey, <laughs> you got me up. up. And then Sierra Elise Norton also has, I mean, like they that like they do trans studies. So their first book, um, Nobody's Supposed to Know, Black Sexuality on the Down Low. Um, that may be a bit more accessible than a racial history of trans identity because anytime you're talking about history and you having to situate that, it might it's gonna read a bit more academic. Um so yeah, you might start with nobody's supposed to know if you had trouble okay. with black girl yeah. stars. Oh, maybe I just need to get over it. Like it's from the library, I can take forever if need be. Just to I mean, yeah, but also that's how you get into a reading slum. Speaking from experience, like if the text is not opening itself to you in that moment, put that joker in reverse and pivot. I'm the queen of pivoting. And writing and in reading, can't nobody turn on their heel like me and go in the opposite direction to get ice cream. Let's, you know, you just gotta give up the fight sometimes. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and for me, I don't know if this ever happened to you, um, Brad or Chloe, but sometimes I'll read a book that will re spark my interest in finishing the other book. So, mm, for yes. example, How to Be Anti Racist. I was like, really? I read that book three times, but I was just like, nah, for the first time, because I, it just was heavy. And then mm. I was reading Hood Feminism by Makiki Kendall. And I was like, mm. oh, this is what's blah, blah, blah. So that's why mm -hmm. I read it three times. And I always feel like I have to spend more time. And we talked about that briefly earlier. I have mm -hmm. to spend more time reading nonfiction because there's just so much stuff that I want to consume and connect. Like it's like my brain go into Venn diagram mode yeah. or uh the brainstorming web and I'm like da -da -da -da. <laughs> and I just gotta sure. like, go back and reread stuff. Yeah, like I listened to the uh the Dark Fantastic so I could finish it because Deidre had already finished it. Yeah. But I it, like the minute I was like, oh I wanna use this in my dissertation I had to buy. Because I was like, oh, all right. like I'm hearing this, I'm hearing that, like references to Morrison, references to Cohen. Like I'm not gonna be able to chart that if I don't write it down, dog ear that page. Sometimes having multiple texts open at the same time, which is how I end up nice. having these towers of books open with their own municipality, area code, mayoral elections, so on and so forth. Amen. And like, so it's just, it really, and that's the other reason why I'm like, who's reading this entire book? Because I'm gen, I'm generally tracing ideas across the discourse, sometimes even more than your whole argument, right? Like, I just want to know your, like for Michelle, right, Physics of Blackness. Have I read Physics of Blackness? Yes. Have I read the entire book? I said what I said. So, like, I'm tracing her. Like, I want to know what she means by physics of blackness. I want to know what what her term middle passive epistemology means. Once yeah. I have that, I have my golden ticket. I'm on my way to the next place to figure out how else we're talking about temporality and black critical theory. Yeah. And then I just go in that way. So, yeah. yeah. Thing, I'm reading for ideas. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, I love to read a book. And reading couple like a couple books that is in the same subject, and realize like I want to read the founder of the idea, right? And then I want to mm -hmm. read how is what it how it was influenced and transformed mm -hmm. by other thoughts. Yeah, so, yeah, that's how I am right now with Octavia E. Butler. Shout out to Injury for really getting me to be involved in her work because. Um, there's a book that came out called The Lessons by Cadwell. Oh, Turnbull, Turnbull. yeah. Yeah, and I can easily see how he was influenced by Octavia E. Butler while reading that book. So for me, I like yeah. reading mm. like original thoughts and then seeing how yeah. it has been influenced by other upcoming um, mm -hmm. authors or theorists or whatever. Wow. For sure. All right. We nailed it.
I think I hadn't said my three ones. I'm going to try and read this here. <laughs> so I think I'm looking at, um, what was it? Black Diamond Queens, African-American Women in Rock and Roll by Maureen Mahone. Um, I just like music and I don't know. I, I'm getting, I listened to a lot of like rock and stuff growing up. So I'm also interested to find out more about like black women who've been doing it. Like I didn't find out about Sister Rosetta Tharp until like very, fairly recently. Um, so that's one. And then there is, okay, this is like um, Trace, Memory, History, Race in the American Landscape by Laura Savoy. It's kind of like a geology book. Um, I think it's, I don't know if it's an ethnography, but it's kind of like talking about the geology of the United States and like rock formations in the earth and like linking that also to like history and like geopolitics and like the author's family uh, journey. Um, and what's the last one going to be? I think this one's like a collection of essays and I think it's very academic. So now I'm going to see if JSTOR has them. <laughs> Black on Earth, African-American Eco-Literary Traditions by Kimberly Ruffin. Um, so I think that's like nature writing um, and like how people have related to the idea of nature and all that stuff. You got some good picks. Thanks. Thank <laughs> <No. laughs> Uh, so I think that's all my questions. Is there anything anyone else wanted to talk about as it comes to nonfiction? Um, or not? I think we talked about everything. Okay. Kiki, I will say Kiki mentioned um, In the Wake um, by Christina Sharp, which came out of Duke, Uni Duke University Press, just be doing it. Like, I just... <laughs> I just trust them. Like, if it comes out of Duke, you know it's got to be some serious business. That's and they're they about Minnesota, University yeah, of yeah. Minnesota Press. Mm -hmm. They're yep. doing it. They do the darn thing, and their covers be on point as well. Um, but I think, and I'm talking about this on my channel later um, in the month, um, about, like, the relationship between art and critical literature. And so... Um, Kiki mentioned that like Dion, like like Elizabeth, um, Ebony Elizabeth Thomas and Dion Brenner were like referencing in the wake and like highly, it came out in like, 2016, highly celebrated instantly and continually. Yeah. Um, but she, um, and again, the first chapter and we move. Um, so <laughs> she references Dion Brand a lot though it's like she references the door uh, a map to the door of no return she references um another's collection of poetry called like verso i think like particularly verse 55 so like the way that she theorizes the weight which is her um her terming for the um the afterlife of slavery which like Sadi she's definitely in conversation with Sadia Hartman. I think Kiki mentioned her earlier talking about losing yeah, her mother. Yeah. Um her um Hartman's first text was in 1997. What was it called? Scenes of subjection, the making of like race and identity in 19th century America. Seminal text like you can't talk about the afterlife of slavery without going through Hartman's scenes of subjection. And so she, in Lose Your Mother, actually is when she introduces the term afterlife of slavery, talking about that it's like considering life chances and an intimate relationship with death and dying and then so on and so forth. And so Sharp then takes that and talks about we're living in the wake of slavery and then talks about like the wake of a bullet, the wake of a boat, all these different things. And so her way of theorizing is also very poetic, but she talks about Brand's um, To the Door of No Return as talking about like the doorway into um, the middle passage where she's talking about like the doorway of slave castles and how like passing through that doorway inaugurates a journey um, and like, we're like on the other side of that whatever whatever but I just think that the relationship that critical theorists have to poetry and how they weave it into the their to their theorizing is just so compelling that's all here here <laughs> <laughs> If you were a lawyer, I would not want to be up against you. Amen. <laughs> oh my God. 
Thank you, Bree. Sister Bree, you really be lifting me up because I'm really over here just surrounded by books, like shoulders hunched, typing no. on my little. My friends call me the hype person. I'm you always are. I'm always trying to hype somebody up. I'll see my niece. I'm like, look at you, melanin on fleek. Nobody could ever, ever compare to you. Boom. Always laughing. Lift the babies up, period. Babies need to be lifted. They do. Let's get lifted. Okay, vocals. Huh? <laughs> okay, vocals. <laughs> Listen, my life is a musical. Like, yeah. on my channel for a little minute, I was just like, I was talking to my cohort mate, and he literally just puts up with me. Yeah. Because, like, in any given conversation, I could go from talking about anime to musicals to science fiction and fantasy stuff. You really um, give me big Gemini energy. I'm a Virgo. Mm. My mother's a Gemini, though. We don't have to talk about that experience because... <laughs> I, as an earth sign, need stability. And I spoke to your twin five minutes ago and she said we were all cool. And now Damn, you're saying- Damn, now I can never be a mom. I just Gemini responsibly. Just Gemini responsibly. That's all just I'm saying. Responsibly. That's it. Yay. <laughs> just telegraph who we're talking to and then we can all govern ourselves accordingly. But that, that Chloe, is why I'm cleaning up the pivot. <laughs> Called survival. It'd be it's like, like oh, we're that. not, we're not doing that anymore. Okay, we're just uh, okay. All right, cool, 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 cool. Okay. Yeah, okay. I mean, yeah. we like a lot of stuff. Listen, like what you like, but that's why I'm a musical. I'm into a lot of things. Okay. Well, I think that's the conversation. Yeah. <laughs> needs to <laughs> take a nap. I don't know why it happened so fast. It came. The spirit came upon you real quick. It did. To be fair, it didn't sleep that well. And I had to be up really early. So Me too. I got my first vax today. <gasps> oh, congrats. Yep. Chloe, are you vaccinated? No. I haven't really been trying, though. I <laughs> no, but I didn't put that much effort into it. So, you know. <laughs> I, do have a, I do have a sort of secret. Um, I've been fully vaccinated since January. Nice. Wow. That's impressive. Yeah. In January, I was still taking a wait and see approach. I was like, let's see <laughs> not the way and see. who doesn't. I'm just saying who's gonna continue to walk around after the needle and who's not. Cause at that point I was like, y'all came up with this very quickly. And to me, it seemed like y'all were afraid of a fuzzy orange. Like God made oranges. There's no need to fear them. And the orange was like, get you a vaccine. And all of a sudden we have one. And I was like, you're giving me Tuskegee vibes, although it was difficult for people to get them at first. So, you know, also and not. But the Tuskegee vibe, that part. And it's like, y'all, they weren't addressing the the cultural like mistrust between the medical community they were just like see y'all then i was like first of all lower your voice <laughs> and, and let's fix your tone as well <laughs> first of all so it was it was that for me where i was like i don't trust you enough to just go get a vaccine because you said so and i had people like in the medical like who were more invested in like medical language and literature that were like vaccines don't get produced this quickly and i was like vaccines don't so i was like i was already waiting to be on 10. and then um to the barbecue on 10. absolutely have my own plate my own tupperware eating out of it as i walked up so but then there was like this colloquium um that my that my church, like church, there was like a Church of Christ colloquium where there were like medical professionals. Um, and they were like, y'all, here's the thing. This is like a strain of SARS or something like that. We already had the cultures usually and you have to like fight. So that's why we were able to do it faster. All of the all of the process was on it, blah, blah, blah. And so then I was like, okay, I still want to take a wait and see it. So me and my parents had a deal that if I did not look for my new apartment on Craigslist, they would not take the vaccine yet because both of us are going to be responsible in our next life choices. Um, and, and so... Not to Craigslist. My mom was like, please don't. My mom was like, okay, well, then we can get the vaccine where you're social this. And she was like, that's fine. We can make a deal. But then the Arkansas governor lifted the mask mandate 
And I was like on their Wednesday night Bible study on Facebook Live and people were asking questions. And I was like, I was like, what happened? All your voices are remarkably clear. Not a muffled voice in the chorus. What's going on? Mm -hmm. And so at that point, I was like, mom, I'm going to need to go ahead and get this vaccine. I look like my line sister sent me some like stats, like a comparison of Pfizer, Moderna, Johnson and Johnson numbers were tight. And I was like, at this point, let's go ahead and get, get shot. So they got shot two days ago and I got shot this afternoon. Damn, everybody getting shot. Everybody getting shot. You, well, you know how they do us. We're living <laughs> in the way. And that is what you call a full circle moment. Chloe, take us out. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks everybody for joining. Um, have a good rest of your day. Bye. <laughs> Bye, y'all.